Appreciate it. <laughs> Round two, night two. It's going to be even better. There's no shortage and there's no limit to the power of God. We are finite individuals. And when God encounters us, uh, things have to change. Things cannot stay the same. And I am so excited to see a bunch of you back here for night two. I love seeing a lot of families in here tonight because there's going to be an emphasis on that. Um, before I jump right into where we're going tonight, uh, last night when everything was wrapped up, it was really encouraging, refreshing for me because as I looked around, I saw little kids running around chasing each other. I saw different generations connecting with one another. And for me, it was really refreshing because I get the opportunity to be on the road a lot, but that also means that I'm not home a lot in a church setting, in a local church setting. And when I think about heaven and I get a picture of heaven, I think about seeing young and old, different cultures, different ethnicities coming together under one name, under one person, and last night looked a lot like heaven. And I'm so thankful that this is a church that values one another, that values different generations, different ethnicities, that values different upbringings, because in the kingdom of God, there is no differences, but we are one under him. God does not see the color of skin that you have or that you were born into, but we all bleed red, and Christ is our king, and that is who we come under, and that is who uh, we worship and lift up. Amen? Tonight is all about more, more of heaven in our family. Last night, if you were not here, we talked about more of heaven in you and what it looks like to have more of heaven in you. God created me a pure heart. God created me a steadfast heart. And we got to talk about that last, and last night in Psalm 51. And what we're going after tonight, I believe, is something that's on the mind of the Holy Spirit, something that is grieving his heart, something that is on his mind. And when God created the world and when God made us, you and I, individuals, and he spoke out with his voice, let there be light, and when God made man in his own image, and then God decided it was not good for man to be alone, and some of you men sitting there are like, dear Jesus, thank you for noticing that because I needed my wife, but God saw it was not good for man to be alone, so he created a helper, a suitor for him. Eve was taken out of man. Adam spoke who she was as woman. Adam had the authority to do that, and ever since the beginning of time, when God brought one man together and one woman together and joined them to be one flesh, God established a covenant for marriage. It was God's way of doing things, Marriage and God's original intent and design was between one man and one woman coming together to be one flesh. That was the intent and heartbeat of God's marriage. And it is no surprise to me today why we face the things that we face, why we hear the things going on politically, why we hear the things going on in our country. It does not come at a shock to me and a surprise to me because ever since God created and called it good, called it pure and called it right, the enemy has been trying to take what God spoke, what God said, trying to twist it, trying to corrupt it, and trying to do everything he can to break apart a covenant. The reason why the enemy goes after marriages specifically is because marriage is a demonstration and a picture of the gospel. Marriage in its purest form reflects who God is. And so in turn, we have an enemy that goes after marriages, especially marriages within the church. Some might be surprised to find this out, but the church, those in the church and those who attend church have just about the same divorce rate as those outside the church. It's not too far off. The enemy will do anything he can to drive a wedge between a mom and a dad, drive a wedge between a husband and a wife, and now the enemy will do whatever he can to try to take the thought of marriage that God designed, throw it outside the window, and say, you can marry whoever you want, you can do whatever you want, you can identify with whatever you want to identify with, and here's what troubles my heart with all of this. What troubles my heart and what I believe troubles the heart of God is this next generation desperately needs to be reached, 
Yet more than ever before, this next generation is growing up in a culture and growing up in a mindset that's very confusing. It's very hard to figure out because now they're being told from the rooftops that whatever they want to be like or whoever they want to become or if they wake up feeling like they want to be a girl, they can be a girl, so on and so on. And it's a very confusing time for this next generation to grow up in. There is an urgency in the spirit to reach the next generation for Christ. There's an urgency on God's heart, on God's mind to reach the young people of America, to reach the young people in the city of Urbandale and beyond. As the church, we are called to step up and pass on the faith to the next generation. We have a responsibility to play. God is not letting us off the hook, and God himself could walk down here and do it himself, but God has given the local church to step up and do something about it, to step up and make a difference. God's heart breaks for the next generation. When you look all throughout scripture, you see what's on the mind of God and the heart of God. You see that Jesus came and died for his bride who gave up his life for the church, but you see a charge to reach the next generation that's coming because without the next generation knowing, we potentially can skip and miss out on a generation ever knowing or believing. More than ever before, we are seeing a biblical, illiterate generation coming behind. A majority of kids growing up in our churches do not know the word of God or understand the word of God. Where is the breakdown? Where is the breakdown with so many young people not knowing the word of God, not understanding who he is, and then on top of that, going to school, going into society, and hearing so many different things that they can do and that they can become? There is a problem, and it grieves the heart of God. The enemy will steal, kill, and destroy the very things that God has done, that God has spoken. God set up these things originally so that we could experience his fullness and experience his best. One of the purposes that are on my wife and I's life and the ministry that we get to do comes straight from Scripture in Psalm 71, verse 14. As for me, I will always have hope. I will praise you more and more. My mouth will tell of your righteous deeds, of your saving acts all day long, though I know not how to relate them all. Verse 16, I will come and proclaim your mighty acts, sovereign Lord. I will proclaim your righteous deeds and yours alone. Since my youth, God, you have taught me and to this day, I declare your marvelous deeds. Listen to this. This is important. Verse 18, even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation and your mighty acts to all to are to come. There was a responsibility on the psalmist that said, even when I am old and gray, God, let my heart beat within me to do everything I can to reach the next generation. God, may I not depart this earth until I've completed the race that you've put on my life to complete, but to sow into the next generation that's coming. God, wake up the church, and God, wake up our hearts to have a fire and a fervency for the next generation. God, to be a mouthpiece, not just to love the kids and grandkids we have our own, but to choose to love a world that is fatherless, broken, and orphaned. God, wake up our hearts. Wake us up, God. Let me ask you a question. A boy with long hair at the age of 17 years old decides to wear heels, decides to wear a dress, put on makeup, and walk down the center aisle and attend your Sunday morning service do not answer this out loud. What is the very first thought that comes through your mind when you see a young man, 17, dressed in a dress, wearing heels and makeup? What is the very first thought on your mind? Some might say, I need to go check on my kids and make sure my kids are okay. Some might say, I'm not going to attend here anymore because of the fact that I noticed that there wasn't any leadership that took action or there wasn't any leadership that did something about it. Some of you might be freaked out, not know what to say, or make a judgmental comment towards the person sitting in the service. Potentially, there are all sorts of kinds of different responses that you and I might face or that you and I might think about, but this happened at our church. A young man walked in wearing heels, makeup, and this young man was hurting. He didn't tell the story when he came into our church. But he was searching. He was trying to figure out what's going on. I went over and I greeted him and I said, I'm so glad you're here. What's your name? He said, my name's Tom. Tom happened to come weeks after weeks. One of the very first things he said, he said, tell me, what do you believe? 
Do you believe gays can get, get, get together and be married? Do you believe that two men can get married? Do you believe in having transgenders? And are you okay with that? He asked me all these questions right away. He assumed that I would be caught off guard by his appearance because what I did not know is there were several churches that asked this young man to leave his church because they did not fit the mold of what this man was wearing. The young people in America are growing up in a confused time. They're hearing so many mixed messages. Not only that, but they're dealing with fatherless homes, some of them dealing with abuse at a young age, dealing with sexual abuse, some of these kids. I want to read a story to you from this man named Tom. Three years later, because of what happened at a church in Bloomington, Minnesota, Tom writes this. In 2013, three wonderful and enthusiastic men chose to volunteer at the Kennedy High School lunches on Tuesdays, in which I decided to always go to their lines God knew exactly what he was doing. The week before my birthday, I told them I was turning 18. They asked if they could come by my table, to which I said yes, so they did. After two weeks of talking after my birthday, they asked if I belonged to a church, which I did, but they still invited me to attend Wednesday night for their youth services at 7 p.m. They also offered to bring me to church and pick me up and bring rides. I was invited to their youth service at Cedar Valley by Micah McDonald, Dave Ritter, and Brent Silkey. One evening, that night, I wore sweatpants and high heels. Yes, I had no sense of fashion. I went up to Micah and asked why and the other pastors didn't care that I wore those clothes. All he said was, God knows the heart. That not only gave me incredible insight of, into their church, but also showed me that these pastors and now friends were going to unconditionally love me. So I returned again and again and again and again and again, all the way through the end of August. Fast forward to spring of 18. I'm just getting started with my porn addiction recovery. I begin going back to the young adult events. Once a young adult, always a young adult. After seeing invites on Facebook from one of the pastors, I began feeling the Holy Spirit leading me to become a member. In August, I let Jesus in my heart for good. In September, began attending next step classes. The second, which told us to be baptized if we haven't or if we were as babies, when we didn't know Jesus nor how to accept him. On November 18th of 2018, I had the joy and honor of publicly declaring my new faith in Jesus and walk with him. And on January 6th of 2018, I became an official new member. Thank you to the pastors for running a church that welcomes people as they are into this credible church and sharing the love of Jesus with them. And in this picture is a picture of him getting baptized. The love of Jesus does not look at the outward appearance, but Jesus looks at the heart. And we're growing up in a time where as a church, we need to be ready for all types of people, all types of backgrounds and belief, to be ready to welcome them with open arms, but not wavering from the truth that we preach. After a service in particular, when I preached on marriage with what the word of God had to say marriage, he came up to me and he said, I disagree with your preaching, but I can't leave this place because I don't feel love anywhere else. He said this three years ago, I disagree with your preaching, I don't agree with what you just said, but I don't feel love like this anywhere else. Fast forward three years later and you see what the truth of God's word does inside somebody's heart. His truth will not return void, it will not come back empty. And it's the love of Christ that leads people into repentance. We desperately need to reach this next generation, and it might look different or maybe be uncomfortable for how it plays out or how it looks, but we gotta be willing to go all in. There is an attack on families in America. There's an attack on marriage in America. There's a lie surfacing out there that divorce does not impact kids. Oh, actually, it might be better if we're not together because our kids would be better and our kids won't be impacted. When divorce does impact children, it does impact the kids. There are three things that I want to share with, with you guys tonight that impacts having more of heaven in the home, more of heaven in family. But before I get into that, I want you to understand where I've come from. My dad was a youth pastor, a motivational speaker, a businessman. He was the hero of my life at the age of 13. My dad walked out on a family. He cheated on my mom with multiple women. My dad got into drugs. 
The very, in, the very person who introduced me to Jesus had walked out of my family. My dad was married to my mom for 17 years. I had three younger sisters. I was the oldest in my family. And watching my dad leave was a very hard thing at a young age because I was very impressionable at the age of 13. I all of a sudden became the man of the house. I started to work at the youngest age possible, trying to provide for everything. I watched my dad as he gave his life to drugs. I remember going to his house, seeing drug articles and different hard liquor and different things out laying out all over the place and being in a really hard position trying to figure out what am I going to believe, who am I going to follow, what am I going to do. Seeing my mom being a stay-at-home mom to all of a sudden now being a single mom and having to work full-time and going to school, it was a hard time. It was a hard thing to go through. I watched firsthand what it looks like to have an enemy try to rip apart a covenant. I watched firsthand as addiction set it back into my dad, where my dad had been free for so many years. I watched firsthand what it looks like for the enemy to steal, kill, and destroy hope, joy, love, security, safety, identity within a young family. I watched as it tore apart our family and tore apart our marriage and it tore apart our home. I watched as my dad was arrested in our home because of an altercation with my mom. Police come into our house, see him arrested. I've watched in my living room where I see my dad stumble in drunk from the bars late at night. There was a lot of things as a young man that I witnessed and that I endured and I saw today. My mom had a decision to make as that's who I lived with. And there were three things that I saw play out that we see from scripture that brought about more of heaven in our family. And whether you're a single parent in here or you come from a messed up past or you've walked into a divorce or you're living in the midst of sin or all those kinds of things, there are some things I want to share straight from Joshua that transcend into our culture today that can renew more of heaven in our home and more of heaven in our family. A year after my dad left my Mom, my younger sister, who was eight years old, was diagnosed with stage four cancer. I just watched my dad walk out of my family. Now the doctor says my younger sister has a 20% chance left to live. This was the home that I grew up in. This is what I saw play out. But when we turn our eyes to scripture, Joshua gives us a model of what we're called to do in our families and in our homes to see more of heaven exist there. If you're taking notes tonight, your first point is this, is gather your family around God's story. Gather your family around God's story. After Moses was done leading the people, Joshua was charged to lead the people. And in Joshua 24, to close up the chapter in Joshua, in the book of Joshua, it says, then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel they presented themselves before God. In other words, Joshua said, okay, everybody in the land of Israel, I'm calling everyone to come together. Everyone assemble and meet here. And the purpose of this was Joshua wanted to gather every single person to hear about God's story for them. Joshua played the role in reaching the next generation. Joshua played the role that was put on God's life, the responsibility of the leader of these people to make sure that every person knew what God had done for them. Joshua spoke up in front of them and said, don't forget through Isaac, through, through Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob, through God leading us into the promised land and all these different things. The whole point of gathering around the assembly was to gather the family around God's story. What we are called to do in our homes as grandparents, as husbands, as wives, as moms and dads, or maybe even a child in your family and you're a lot like me and you don't have a family, maybe you come from a broken family, we're called by God to gather our family around God's story. We're called to be reminded, we're called to fix our heart, fix our eyes on what God has done for us. I think one of the most powerful things is what my grandfather did before he passed away. My grandpa was a Lutheran minister, and he started reading the scripture about how God poured out his spirit and baptized people in the Holy Spirit. The Lutheran church kicked out my grandpa because he started believing that part of scripture that the Holy Spirit baptizes. He wasn't allowed to preach anymore, and so my grandpa was a mailman until he retired and eventually passed away. But one of the things my grandpa did is before he passed away with pancreatic cancer, and maybe some of you might wanna do something like this, is he called all of his children, he had eight children, 
and he called all of his grandchildren over by family, and with each grandchild and with each child, he gave them a note card specific to them. And on the note card was a scripture verse, and it was his prayer of blessing to his grandchild and to his children. Our grandpa would lay his hands on us, begin to prophesy over us, begin to bless us. And really, you want to know what our grandpa was doing? Our grandpa was gathering the family together to gather around God's story so that we might not forget the faithfulness of God, so that we might not forget the goodness of God. If you find yourself in a hard position, a hard spot, or a hard place, may I beckon and challenge you to remember who God is, how good he is, and what he's done for you. Half of being a Christian anyway is just remembering. Remembering who he is, remembering what he's done. And better yet, if you're a leader of a home, they say if a father comes to know Christ, a man in a house comes to know Christ, it's more than likely that 97% of his family will all follow Christ too. There's an attack on men in our society today for men to kind of do whatever they want and not really participate in their family, not really give a rip about their kids. Some of us father or parent in such a way because we haven't had it modeled to us or our father was kind of a certain way towards us. And in turn, there's a gap in our society and our generation, especially for the next generation, for fathers to lead their homes spiritually and for fathers to do so biblically. And what God is calling as fathers in the room, as men in the room, is to step up just like Joshua and to gather our families around the story of God to make it a priority in our home. How does it look like to gather your family around the story of God? It looks like this, men in the room. Family, as the father of this household, we are going to church every single Sunday. Fa family, as the father of this household, we're gonna go to our midweek service on Wednesday night. We're gonna go and we're gonna be a part of it. You wanna know why? Because the word of God says, do not forsake meeting together. God does something dynamic when we come together as a body of Christ. His presence is here because we're here uplifting his name. We're glorifying him, and God's going to do something dynamic in our family. We need men to come back into the places of their homes and lead spiritually how God's called you to lead. God's bestowed that upon us to lead the way in that. And for those of you who might be an empty nester or your kids or grandkids are off, you're called to be a father in the church and to father these young people that run around, to speak life over them. It means making the house of God a priority and gathering together a priority. It means getting them around youth pastors and kids pastors and youth leaders. One of the best decisions my mom ever did, when my dad left our family, the church plant fell apart, and my dad took off, and here was my mom with four young kids working two jobs, going to school, my mom, the best decision she ever did in her entire life, in my opinion, in raising us kids, is one day she picked up the phone, she called a friend and said, where is the best church that I can bring my kids to? Where is the best family church? You wanna know what my mom was doing? Although my dad was outside the picture, my mom was saying, I want my family to be gathered around the story of God. I want my kids to know who God is. I want my kids to be rooted and anchored in Christ. Their lives are already a mess. Their dad just walked out home. They desperately need other men in the church to come into their life. They desperately need fathers to speak into them. They need the people of God and they need God. Where is the best church? To any single moms in the room, I want to encourage you to say, keep going. You're doing the right thing. Don't give up. Keep believing in God for your kids. Keep standing up. Let God uphold you. Let God strengthen you. Let his breath and his spirit rest upon you. To any single fathers in the room, the same charge goes to you. God has a way of working through the brokenness, but God does miracles and powerful things when people gather around his story. Let's remember and let's recount. Maybe you're a patriarch, a grandpa, a grandfather. What if every family gathering, the number one priority was to tell your kids and your grandkids the faithfulness of God in your life? What if you chose to tell them about growing up in the Great Depression and growing up in the war era? What if you decided to become a little vulnerable and share how God has brought you through? how God has spoken to you and how God is leading you. There is nothing more powerful than a man of his family getting up and speaking blessing and prophesying over his family. 
There's nothing more powerful than that. And to any man in the room who feels spiritually downcast or feels like you can't be the spiritual leader because your wife kind of is taking that helm, you can start today. And it doesn't have to be the perfect prayer. It doesn't have to be the longest sermon. It doesn't have to be the longest story. God values short and awkward prayers more than he does long and flawless prayers. Start and be awkward about it. But say, no, we're gathering around God's story. Joshua led this people to this moment so that they might be reminded. And then your second point tonight is this is rid your house of sin. Rid your house of sin. In verse 14, it says, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. What Joshua was saying was this, your ancestors screwed up. Your ancestors sinned. They allowed sin into the house, and in turn, that sin tried to be passed down to you, but instead, God has brought you out. God has delivered you. He's brought you into the promised land. Throw away the sin that your ancestors let in. The challenge to you and I leading our homes is to throw away the sin in our houses. Throw away the sin in our homes. Don't allow sin to take root and to exist. Let me ask you a question. What in your home right now is continually leading you into a place of sin? What in your home right now do you have, do you possess, that is constantly bringing you down and leading you into sin? It's leading you away from Christ. We are called to be passionate about setting a new norm in our house. Everywhere I travel and every time I get to preach to the next generation, I do a message specifically, very practically among young people, and they hate this message. And the reason why they hate this message is because I walk right up into their life, and they get ticked off, but it challenges them to the core. This goes for everybody in the room. If what's tripping you up the most in your life is your phone, and that's where God is no longer a part of your life, but your phone is now your God, or your phone is the thing that's bringing sin into your house, Do something radical, and how about charging your phone inside the kitchen? Young people, those of you who have phones and you're tripping up at night in your bedroom or different things like that, what if you went to your parents and said, Mom, Dad, from now on I'm going to charge my phone in the kitchen? This is where kids really freak out. This is where they really hate me. But Mom, Dad, by the way, here's my passcode to my phone, and here's all my passwords to my social media accounts. You can look at every message you want at any point in time. And you can see everything that I'm looking at and it's coming to me every single time. That right there is owning your purity and deciding to get rid of the sin that exists in your house. It's deciding to be accountable and step up. Your faith is no longer your own. Your faith, your faith is no longer your parents. It's now your own. And you're choosing for yourself to get rid of the sin in your house. What are the things that exist? What are the things that are rooted in our house that's leading us into sin? Joshua says, don't mess up like your ancestors did. This is a crazy thought, but some of us right now are getting tripped up with the same exact sin that our mother and father dealt with, or that our grandparents dealt with, or that our great-grandparents dealt with. Some of us are living in that sin that passed down generationally within our fathers, our great-grandfathers, our grandfathers, and so on. There can be generational sins that exist in the home. What do you mean? My father divorced my mom for another woman, left for a neighbor woman that was over at the neighbor's house. Guess what? My dad's dad left for a neighbor lady inside his home. The sin of pornography, the sin of alcohol and drugs, different things like that were the same things that were passed down into our family line. Guess who's supposed to be next according to what generational sin does? Some of us don't recognize it, but the thought patterns in our mind that have yet to be renewed by the Holy Spirit, they come and they've anchored themselves from a place of generations before us that have allowed sin into the house and has not been dealt with, cut off, or done with. And what God wants us to do is to know that by his blood, by what his son Jesus did, 
that you and I have the authority and the power through Jesus Christ to demolish every stronghold that is set up against us, our minds, and so on. The weapons that we fight with are not with this world, but the weapons we fight with are through prayer, the ability to demolish every single stronghold that sets itself up against Christ. You and I are called to take captive every thought that sets itself up against Christ. Let me just let you in on a very vulnerable journey with me and my family. The sins of my father have attempted to come on me and it's attempted to be lived out through my life. And one of the things that has changed me dramatically is going to something called prayer counseling. And what prayer counseling does is that we ask and invite the Holy Spirit into our heart for the Holy Spirit to reveal the areas and the roots of sin in our life as to why they are there and how they even got there. When you invite the Holy Spirit into your life to reveal those kinds of things, Get ready to have a journal and a pen so you can start writing down all the specific things because here's why. Things will come to your mind that you had forgotten about 60 years ago, 10 years ago, or five years ago, but the reason why the Holy Spirit brings it to your attention is because he's leading you through a process to receive forgiveness and to release the offense that was done to you or through a grandparent or so on. The Holy Spirit reveals that to you. It shows you that. So I went through a process of a couple years of the Holy Spirit revealing things to me. Even so much so, I'm going to get very vulnerable here, even so much so, there was an individual inside my home, it rubbed me the wrong way, and after that individual left, it still bothered me, I didn't like what was on that person, what was going on inside that person, and then I was woken up in the middle of the night with a dream from the Holy Spirit, and it was something that one of my grandparents had done to one of their children. And God revealed to me and was showing to me a generational sin that was in the house. And the reason why the Holy Spirit showed me it was not to lead me to it, but he was going to lead me to a place where he wanted to bring breakthrough and freedom. The Holy Spirit led me to a spot. I woke up. I went into our living room. That's the spot I pray. I got down. I said, God, on behalf of my grandparent, I ask for forgiveness on behalf of my grandma. God, would you forgive her? God, would you release forgiveness over our family line? And it was as if, boom, lifted, broke off. God desires to see a clean house. Joshua says, throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped. Have nothing to do with them. Invite the Holy Spirit to give you spiritual insight to defeat the enemy. A powerful prayer you can pray is, God, would you give me spiritual insight on how to defeat the enemy? You start praying that every day, God's going to start giving you things that you have no idea why you're thinking it, but he's giving you insight either to things that are going to come, schemes or plans that the devil has for your life. Your home is to be a dwelling place of God's presence. And by the way, ask God for a sensitivity of the things that are going on inside of your home. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you a sensitivity to the things that are going on in your home. And every time you sense defilement, or every time you sense there was something that was an act against God, you take authority over it and say, not in my house. You say, no more. God equips you to do that. God gives you the ability to do that. I want to illustrate by saying this. My wife and I in our home, we oftentimes try to have worship music going throughout our days in our home, we wake up to worship music sometimes, we turn on worship music, we want our home to be a place where when people come to our house they say, this feels like God's presence, something's different here. We had a man that we were renting in a condo from and he was the landlord and he stepped in and sat down, he said, I own this place, but he said, I've never felt what I'm feeling in this place. That is God's presence, that's what that's described as. The very living room where my dad divorced my mom and sat me and my kids, my sisters down for 17 years of marriage. The same living room where my younger sister was diagnosed with stage four cancer and the doctor said she had a 20% chance left to live. The same living room where my dad was arrested and brought to jail. The same living room that I'd see my dad stumble and drunk. The same living room that I witnessed so much hurt and pain go on as a young boy in my life is the same exact house that my wife and I bought October of 2016, and when we're signing the papers to buy the house, my mom looks at me and she goes, Micah, do you realize what day we're closing on the house? You're signing on the house. I said, no, I know it's October 6th. 
She goes, Micah, this is your dad and I's wedding anniversary. We were supposed to buy the house in, in August. It got pushed back, kept getting pushed back. And the, per the title company said, can you do October 6th? I said, sure, not knowing what day it was. Now let me tell you this. Every day in that living room is where I pray and seek the face of God. Every day in that living room, it's a reminder of God's redemption, God's grace on our home and on our family line, and that what has happened in the past and what has happened over my family line and generations of sin and deceitfulness and brokenness does not need to be my story. It does not need to be your story. But what God does through his power and through his gospel is he takes ordinary, broken, sin-filled nature people like you and I, and he pours out his spirit on us, pours out his grace and his mercy on us, and allows us to see the dead things in our life come to life. He allows us to see the broken areas of our past in our life be resurrected for his glory and his purposes. Now every single day, oftentimes I'll see my two-year-old daughter because I like to pace and pray in the living room. I don't like to sit still and pray. I like to pace and pray. Every so often I'll see my little girl. She'll be right behind me, following me, praying. I'm praying in the spirit. She has no idea, no idea what I'm saying. She's praying in the spirit. I don't understand what she's saying, but I pray for my kids. I pray for my family. I want them to see dad praying and worshiping God when no one else is around. In the very living room that tried to destroy a 13-year-old boy is the very living room where God's grace meets a 32-year-old man. God desires to do the same within your family line, within your homes, within your generation, within your kids, and within your grandkids. We are called by God to gather around the story of God and to also rid our very homes of sin. What you allow in as parents, as moms and dads, that we are gatekeepers. And your last point tonight is this, worship team, you could come on up. But we have got to come to a spot where we say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Every single one of us in this room have be, got to be able to come to a spot where we say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There is no other option. There is no other way. As for this household right here, we will serve God. And I say that with such passion and so much intentionality, knowing full undoubtedly that God loves you more than I could ever love you, that God will watch over you way better than I ever could. And what that means that our family is going to trust God with all of our heart. We're not going to lean on our own understanding standing of things, but we're going to acknowledge him in all of our ways, and he will order the steps of the righteous in our family. We can trust God, family. Constantly coming around the story of God, being reminded of his faithfulness and his goodness, even if darkness enters, even if things don't go the way we want, we will serve the Lord. We will not falter. We will not go to the wayside, and where we are a weak family, you better know he's so much stronger. It, I was preaching in Canada, Calgary, at a Chinese conference. I have no idea why I was preaching at a Chinese conference. I also don't know why I preach a lot of places I do get to preach. I was preaching at a Chinese conference. There was a story that took place there that kind of shook my soul and I felt the Holy Spirit whisper to me, Micah, to start 2017, I want you to start a prayer room in your house. I immediately called my wife, Steph, what do you think about starting a prayer room in our house? She said, let's do it. I started a prayer room in our house, we started visiting it. I would go in there for about five minutes. I'm like, well, I don't know what to pray for now, but five minutes, great left, go back in the next day, spend about five minutes in there. Okay, five minutes, great, awesome. By the end of the year, it was not uncommon to be spending almost two hours a day in this prayer room. And what I would, day, what I would do is I would take my daughter who was newly born, I'd bring her in the room with me, I'd lay her on the floor, and I would hover over her and I'd begin praying in the spirit. I begin praying whatever the Holy Spirit was putting on my mind, themes or things that were on God's heart, begin praying for those. To be someone who says, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord, it means taking responsibility for you 
your life, that no one else runs it for you, but taking responsibility for your own life, your own decisions, your own actions. How in the world do you come to a spot and what does it look like to live out that statement, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord? It looks like this. God is looking for somebody to pray. He's looking for someone that will pray. In Ezekiel 22, in verse 30, he says, I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it, but I found no one. God was looking for one person, somebody that would stand in the gap, somebody that would stand up and pray and seek his face. What are we called to do? To see more of heaven in our families, but we are called, as God says, as he's looking for someone to pray, we are called to be those people that will stand in the gap. Know what I thought for so many years? I thought that being an intercessor was meant for those ladies who pray constantly all day long. I thought that's who that was for. And then I quickly realized that we have the mandate on our life, on every single one of us, to be an intercessor. Jesus was an intercessor. He still is an intercessor. And to be like Christ and to be like Jesus means to be an intercessor too. To stand in the gap for your family. I'm going to get real practical with you in just a minute. We saw another man in scripture live this out. Another man lives this out in Job 1. It says, in the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He threw out sin out of his house. He had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys. Had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the east. Verse 4. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. Listen to this. Verse 5. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Listen to this. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. In other words, what Job decided to do every morning was to be a man who would stand in the gap for his family who said, maybe my children may have sinned, I don't know if they did, but God, if they did, let me offer a sacrifice for you to cover them. In other words, he was saying, God, there will be nobody, no one on this earth that prays more for my kids than me. I am responsible for these seven sons and these three daughters, and there won't be any man, there won't be any person that prays and stands in the gap for them like me. God, let not there be sin in my house, and if there is, God, I will go on behalf of my kids. What does it look like to be somebody who says, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord? It looks like for an ordinary person to be someone that God is looking for, to stand in the gap, to pray and to seek his face. When was the last time somebody caught you praying? When was the last time somebody walked in on you and you were calling down heaven for your family? When was the last time your heart broke for the lost and were praying for family members to come to know him? When was the last time you covered your sons in prayer, your daughters in prayer? May there not be one person who prays more than you for your own. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Your kids might not be serving God, but don't quit and don't stop praying for your kids. Don't stop. Your kids may have walked away from Christ either because of something you've done to them or something that played out in their life. Do not stop praying for them. You notice how in Ezekiel, the Lord said, I was looking for someone that would build a wall. In other words, I was looking for someone to build a hedge. A hedge of protection. You want to know what happens every time you pray for your kids and your grandkids? You want to know what happens every time you pray for your friends at school? Those who are far from Christ, do you realize what you are doing? Your prayer has power, and you are building a wall around the very people you're praying for. What does it look like? 
just as Job would do regularly. Early in the morning, he would wake up Monday, start praying for his kids. Tuesday, praying for his kids. Wednesday, praying for his kids. Thursday, oh God, I don't know if my children have sinned today or yesterday or if there's any wickedness in their heart, but God, remove their guilt from them. Friday, Saturday, one year from that Monday, every single day, what your prayers do is it begins to build a wall for your kids and a hedge of protection around your family. You are building a fortress, a safe place for them to know Christ and to follow Christ, to be hemmed in Him. Did you know it's scriptural and it's biblical to say, God, would you hide my kids from the enemy? Would you hide them in the shadow of your wing? You realize what Jesus said in John 17? Oh God, protect them from the evil one. Pray what Jesus prayed. He prayed they would be protected from the evil one. He prayed that they would be sanctified in the truth of his word. And he prayed that they would be one just as him and the Father are one. As for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. You don't have to be a pastor or even a spiritual leader to every morning say, God, would you bless my children? God, would you put your hedge of protection around them? Your prayers are building a wall for your kids and for your grandkids and your future generations of faith. You wanna know what's powerful? On my dad's side of the family, there was 11 brothers and sisters in my dad's side of the family. There was a lot of brokenness in multiple areas of my dad's family. My son, Malachi, who's four months old, was my grandma's 50th great-grandchild. This was the year of Jubilee, this last year. 50th meaning freedom. And by the way, my son happens to be the first great-grandchild with the last name MacDonald, which means my son is starting a new family line, a new legacy with the name MacDonald, and we get to watch what God does through his faithfulness and goodness onto the next generation. Only God can orchestrate and do that. Only God can bring about that. God desires to bring about wholeness and healing where there's been brokenness. God's to bring about a gathering of us as people around his story to be able to rid our houses of sin or things that are away or apart from him and then to say, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. You and I, we could be a team. <laughs> You're getting good, bro. Need to bring you with me on the road. You'll just know. This is for somebody in the room, probably more than one. There was a lady in our church this last Sunday in her 80s. Her husband and her started the church out of her house, out of their house. They adopted a young boy from Asia. They had a heart to adopt, so they adopted this young boy from Asia. The minute they found out they were adopting, she began praying for this boy, knowing that they would be adopting. The minute the boy arrived, she still kept praying. The boy grew older. There was some dysfunction in the boy's life. He wasn't all quite right. The boy started to rebel against what mom and dad wanted. She still kept praying. The boy began to get in, caught up into the wrong crowd. She still kept praying. The boy ended up becoming a drug addict, a drug dealer, ended up becoming homeless, kicked off to the street, has been addicted for years to drugs. She never stopped praying. She kept praying. Just this last Sunday, this boy that she adopted is close to 40 years old. And he got up and shared a testimony about how he's been sober for three months and has given his life to the Lord. And this mom got up there and was asked, did you ever stop praying for your son? She said, she said no, I never stop praying for my son. Because she's building a wall around her son. To the prodigals who've walked away from Christ, 
from the kids that we've loved and prayed for for so much, that are grandkids, that are coming home. And we're not going to stop praying until we see them come home and become whole. God works through the brokenness and brings about his peace and something beautiful. God, we need you. We need your spirit. We need your presence. If you are in the room tonight and you're willing to say, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord, I just want you to stand to your feet. Joshua said, choose this day whom you will serve. I don't care if you're the youngest kid in the room, you get that choice too. As for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. Here's what I want all of us to do in the room before we move on to a sequence of things that we're going to be praying for. I want us now to ask the Holy Spirit what generational sins are in my parents or grandparents that have attempted to be passed down onto me or that I'm currently living in. What are the things that I find myself being caught up in that were a result of either my parents or grandparents? Or to ask yourself the question, Holy Spirit, what things are in my home that we need to throw away or get rid of? And then when the Holy Spirit shows you that right where you are in your seat, I want you to ask forgiveness on behalf of your parents or grandparents or beyond. I want you to ask for forgiveness for yourself and whoever else the Holy Spirit might be leading you to forgive, I want you to do that. And the Holy Spirit will begin releasing things off of your heart and off of your life. And then I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to fill you, to heal you, to renew you. Can we just take a moment where you are at your seats, no one responding yet, just to ask the Lord those questions. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this moment to shine a giant bright spotlight into every area of past generations of things that have attempted to come on to us or down to us. God, that we might ask for forgiveness, heal those areas that need to be healed. In Jesus' name, just right where you are. The spirit does not lead you into confusion or chaos. He's a spirit of peace. He's a teacher. He's a counselor. He's a helper. And he leads you into all truth. Holy Spirit, I thank you for the work of sanctification in our hearts. Knowing that just like my friend Tom he may come in broken, but years later will be led to a place of a repentant heart and baptized in you and receiving your forgiveness and salvation. God, we release anger or bitterness of those who've gone before us. And now supernaturally, through your power of your Holy Spirit, we honor our father and our mother. We honor our grandfather, our grandmother on both sides. We honor those who've gone before us because they too are in the image of God. We choose not to let things of the past weigh us down or hold us, but we honor the good that was inside of them that was put there by you. 
Lord, I pray for your healing touch inside our minds and hearts and souls all across this room. Just as you pour oil down people's heads and down over their bodies and it washes away sin, I pray now a supernatural outpouring of the oil, a fresh oil, a touch from you over hearts, over minds, over every area of their life. In Jesus' name, I thank you for the completed work on the cross. And there's nothing too far undone or too far gone that you cannot restore and heal. My next call is this. I would love and I would like for every person in the room, you might be 80 or 90 years old, but every person in the room who came from a broken home and that was without a father or without a mother, or at some point in time you were fatherless or motherless, I want you to come meet me right down here in the front. I want you to get out from your seats. You might be 50 years old, 40 years old. Every person who grew up in a broken home was either fatherless or motherless. Would you just come meet me right down here? If there are married couples in the room where you did not come from brokenness, but you come from generations of faithfulness, either elders in the church, maybe there's elders down here, that's fine, pastoral staff with your wives, could I get some married couples down here in the front that'd be willing to pray a prayer of blessing over, over these people? Would you just come right now? Or anybody else that feels like, yep, I'm called to pray and release God's blessing over these people. Here's what I want to do. As I would love, you guys can just line right up in the front and face them. If you guys could take a couple steps back. Any married couple that would come down and just stand in front here, kind of line up all across the way. You guys can kind of keep spreading out down that way and keep spreading out down along that way. That'd be great. What I'm gonna ask in just a minute is that you folks down here find a couple down here that decided to pray. And what I want the couples who responded to come forward to pray for people, I want the husband to pray and I want the wife to pray, both of you to pray. And I want you to pray a father's blessing and a mother's blessing over them, over the people standing here. Pray for them how you would either pray for your own children it might be weird because you're like, this person's older than me. I don't care. I want you to pray that over them. I want you to release that over them. So these people who are down front, you are free to be released to find somebody. And they're just going to pray God's blessing, God's favor, and they're going to speak life over you, okay? So why don't you do that now? Go find someone that you can walk to, go up to. Worship team, you can sing during this time. If we have some worship members that could lead us in a song during this time, 